Marsha Pincus teaches English and playwriting at Simon Gratz High School. She is the first recipient of the George Bartol Art and Education Fellowship established in 1991 to recognize the accomplishments of outstanding artists and teachers in the Philadelphia area who are using the arts in inspired ways to educate young people. I, I had a message to get across. I had a story to tell. I wanted I wanted these people to see this. I wanted I wanted us to look at our situations, the things that's going on, and I want and I wanted them to try to make a change. I was very introverted uh, in the classroom, and um, but with her it was kind of difficult to be that way because just for the mere fact of uh, the configuration of the classroom, we sat in, in a circle and so everybody, you know, saw each other and um, there was no kind of hiding in the corner, you know, so you kind of, um, you, you had your chance to be seen and eventually with the playwriting I had a chance to um, be heard. It's like we, we're leading in a way. We're leading, you know, we're helping you, you know, by knowing more about how you should teach us and, and the, you know, the things that you should teach us and the things that we should learn, you know, that we'd be more interested in. This is a very intensive writing class. Everything that we talk about, we write about. Everything that is discussed on the floor, we write about. We, we write out outlines of uh, everything that's discussed in this room. Like this, this English class is somewhat like um, what you would call open forum. You know, uh, like you're on a, a debating team or something like that. You, you have the circle of discussion and discussion. You lay it out on the floor and you just speak your feelings and your opinions and you're starting to learn from uh, not just fact that's in a book, but you're also learning from each other and learning from different material that we read. English class, you know, you just work. I mean, you might talk to the person, but you just work, but in, in playwriting it's different because you get to talk to the person while you're doing what you're supposed to, so you get to understand them better and know them better. You try and make us like realize how the play is set towards us and not just read the play. Like in other like playwriting or English class, they'll have you read the play, just read it and read it, not really understand it, like get to know it. But in this class, you really get to know it. It's like you get to be put inside the play. The idea that a student can articulate his or her own life, can shape it through dialogue and playwriting was revolutionary for me. Um, it really did teach me how to become a student-centered teacher because when kids write plays, it is their lives that they're writing about. It are their, it's their experiences that they're sharing. Um, James talked about how he picked a little bit from here and a little bit from there to put it all together to write his play. I mean, I couldn't express that any better myself about the process of what they go through. I don't have the answers. I don't have any magic word that will produce a play for them. 
All I do at that point is I facilitate, I provide them with the tools that they need to express their vision of the world. And that's a really important thing for a kid who might have been told he's a failure for three or four years of high school. To be able to come somewhere, put his ideas together, put it on page, have his classmates act it out to be asked to express what it is that he was trying to say, to give his vision of the world right out there for his classmates is very, very empowering for someone, particularly someone who hasn't found success in school before. When I write my play, I think about whatever is going to, I mean, whatever the situation is in the play, it's got to be one that's going to cause the most controversy for me. Because without controversy, if people don't be like, oh man, if they don't want this show here, or they don't want this show here, then it's got to be good, you know? So if my play doesn't, if, if, I, if it doesn't excite me or get whoever I get to read it first, you know, it makes them feel slightly offended or it gets them kind of riled, then I don't feel it's a good play. And the process I go around and writing it, I mean, it's kind of a silly process because I imagine myself going up there, you know, accept the Oscar or whatever for this becoming a movie and all that. <laughs> and, you know, or I imagine how to, you know, I, I hear the crowd's applause as I write the play and I see my characters, you know, doing these things themselves. I mean, I'm like a tool of my creativity, you know what I mean? My characters got a life for their own. All I do is just, you know, help them direct it. Since most of my family is from the South, but, you know, we live up here, but most of my family is from the South on my mother's side, I kind of um, learned more about it being in the country because my my Indian culture is, is there, you know, that's where they're from. So me being there, I learned more about them and about their ways. And then the black side, I've learned more of the, the accent, you know, that southern accent that they have mm -hmm. and the independence that women have down there because they're very independent down there. Tell us how you use that in your play. Okay, well, basically in my play, um, it's a woman. Her name is Sophia. You know, she's been insulted by her husband because she's not a typical black woman. She's different. And so he want to insult her and call her names. And he wants her to depend on him, but she won't. That's not her. So he, he mocks her, you know. He make fun of her. And, she, you know, so it's like she couldn't take it anymore, so she left. She got fed up. So that's mm -hmm. how I used it. Mm -hmm. When I write my play, I look at, like, like other things, I look at televisions and see how the people react. And you t like, it's like you're taking a piece of everything. So like, it's a, like you hear a person say something, like something stupid, and you can take that stupid word and make something out of it. And plus, it's like, it's just, it's just like you just go, like, go different places, and then you just look, and you take pieces out of everything, and you combine it into one, and you make a story and a play that means something and have a meaning behind it. And that's... I guess that's how you know, I make my play. So go ahead and just step, all right? Yo, man, who the hell are you, a father or something? Man, just stay away from Everybody, that's just all. calm down and be rational. Well, you can tell that to Tim since he's the one after you praise you over something stupid. Go ahead, all right? Not a piece of property of yours. Look, just shut up, all right? You're starting to piss me off. Who the hell are you talking to, huh? Just get your damn all thing right, out of here. Just calm down, all right? I'm not telling you to shut up. doing a lot of thinking about playwriting myself and I really think that it, it, it gets to the bottom of, of who we are as human beings. From the earliest time that people can talk and interact, 
They play. What do little children do? They get together and they make believe. They play imaginary games. This idea of students writing plays is to me just an extension in some ways, or a sophistication of that very, very human behavior that they've done in early childhood. Walk into any kindergarten classroom and what will you see children doing? Playing house, playing make-believe, inventing stories. That's what these kids are doing, but they're doing it at a higher level. But it just strikes to that very ele elemental chord of being human. Mrs. Pinkers gave us the assignment to do the autobiographies, you know. I really, I almost got an F on it because I refused to do it because of a lot of things that happened in my past that I thought best left buried. But see, being as though the environment I was in, I guess she helped me to deal with my past better and uh, you know look back and see that, that everything was not a total waste and that you know as long as I can accept my past I can have a better future here at the, in the Crossroads program at Simon Grace. So I guess it helps you to become a whole individual instead of you know some kind of nighthead on the streets or something. We do autobiographies and we discuss things about each other I mean and we let out really emotional things and and it's good that I mean people are mature enough in the English class to hold it in and what's in the classroom stays. I haven't enjoyed English since the ninth grade because, you know, for various reasons. But in here it's like it's like more of a family. Whenever I did some work, like wrote a play or a story, they would just censor it and tear it all up. But see when I got here, I mean it's like I could just let my creative juices flow, you know. I mean just whatever I wanted to write, I could write it. If people accepted it, then bam, they accepted it. If they didn't, then you know, forget about them, cause you know I'm doing this for me. And like when Mike said, you know, um, last year, well actually for three years, I wasn't even thinking about coming to school, cause you know personal matters. But when I got here and I got in the Crossroads program, it was like I actually felt like man. Well, I think I better go to school because, you know, it's, it was fun for a change. It wasn't just like, okay, students, let's sit down and read chapter such and such. Man, I mean, that's enough to make anybody want to stop going. I agree with that. I think Michael or Rondé or, or James one, or Eric, one of the young men said it. I mean, how, how, um, how willing would you be to come to a job every single day if it were boring? How willing would you be to come someplace every single day if you didn't feel that you were getting anything out of it? Often in the beginning of the year when students walk in my room, some of them, their eyes are completely glazed over. They're completely like closed doors. And I wonder, I said, what, what's behind those eyes? What's it going to take to kind of open that up? And what I think you've noticed from looking at my students is there's a sparkle in all their eyes. They are alive, they are engaged, but they needed to find a place where they could bring all of their experiences to bear um, in, in the classroom. Is the past in the past or is the past with us? I mean, are we sitting here ourselves right now with our personal past, our historical past, our racial past, our cultural past? We have all that with us here right now in this classroom. Do we? How many people think we do have it with us in the classroom? Okay. Now, if we all agree that we, who says no, we don't? Some of my friends that are in Crossroads, they look at Miss Pincus and they say, that's just a white lady teaching um, something or other. When I come in here, it's not like a racial thing. It's just like there's somebody trying to put something in your head that's worth saying. It's like a multicultural class. Like last year in this English class, we did things on the Jews, African American, Japanese, Chinese, and so forth. And as we were talking and bring up different discussions, we were able to relate to everything that was, that was discussed in the class. It was like um, we were sitting here um, analyzing the world and looking at it through a different type of um, eyes than we normally do in a regular English class. Um, say like um, you're looking, facing the board, you know, you're just looking forward, sitting there reading out of a book and whatnot. It makes it interesting. Once my classroom became student-centered, I found myself having to deal with issues that I had never had to deal with before. And those issues were around cultural heritage, cultural values, um, literature. My students were culturally different from me. And for all of these years, I had been teaching as if I had no culture, and as if my students had no culture, and there was just this one universal curriculum or idea that, that 
you know, fit everybody. Once I became a student-centered teacher, it was my students' cultural values that came tumbling into the classroom. When I asked them to go home and um, interview people to get stories, it was cultural stories that their grandparents had brought from the South. Some of the stories even had roots to Africa. When I asked them to tell autobiographies, there were often experiences of racial discrimination. These kinds of issues had never been something that I had to deal with before as a teacher because it was not a, a student-centered classroom. So I needed to come up with strategies for dealing with these new issues that were coming up in my classroom, not the least of which was to re-educate myself. I, I wasn't standing on firm ground. I didn't know all the answers. I was not a scholar of African American literature. But together in our joint inquiry, our mutual inquiry, we raised questions and learned about it together. Okay, like like they were talking about race and stuff. Well, with me, it's like when I got in this class, I wasn't as like shy to like say what you know what's my culture. It's like at most schools, it's like a I went to an all white school before, and it's like before I just I would never say anything. I felt that it's not my place to speak up about who I am or you know my my background. But now it's like I want to talk about it. I have to talk about it because if they don't know, then they just gonna judge me and just, oh well, she's this or she's that, and I have to tell them what you know. Just who am I? What I've been having my students do is constantly reflect on their own process, um, constantly stop and say, okay, what are you thinking at this point? Why are you thinking this? What ideas led to this? How does this idea connect to that idea? How does what we're talking about now connect with what we're talking about earlier in the year? How did what you wrote today seem compared to what you wrote last month? And by constantly asking the student to reflect on his or her own thinking makes them become thinkers. They are able to articulate their thought press, they're, they're able to articulate their thought processes, they're able to articulate the development of an idea that they have because they have been asked to do this constantly. If you're only asked to fill in blanks on worksheets, that's all you will be able to, that's how you will be able to think. If you ask them to do complex tasks, to evaluate their own work in very complex ways, they will be able to do that. It just follows. We want kids to be thinkers, then we must give them tasks that enable them to think. Playwriting is about thinking, it's about problem solving, um, it's about collaborating, it's about all those things that we say we want our students to be able to do. It's all embodied in the act of creating a play. Terrence Jenkins. First place winner, 1992 National Young Playwrights Festival. His play, Taking Control, was produced off Broadway at New Horizons Theater in 1992. Allison Birch, first place winner, 1990 National Young Playwrights Festival. Her play, Believing, was produced off Broadway at New Horizons Theater in 1990. Between 1988 and 1992, several Simon grad students from Marsha Pincus's class have won prizes in the Philadelphia Young Playwrights Festival, to which more than 300 plays a year from throughout the Philadelphia region are submitted. From 1988, to 1992, there were eight first place winners. There were eight second place winners. There were four third place winners. Many have also gone on to continue their education at various colleges and universities. 